I teach um, environmental engineering, water resources engineering. Um, on the environmental side, just risk assessment and uh, hazardous waste site investigation, hazardous waste management. Um, and on the water resources side, it's it's uh, water quality modeling and, and surface water, uh, hydrology and water resources development and the engineering aspects. Yeah, I've done a lot of risk assessment. Uh, after I got my PhD, I went to work for, for a consulting firm uh, and that was the focus of my career for quite a few years was risk assessment. Uh, I did uh, just an analysis of the worst case potential spills uh, from the pipeline. And um, as part of the NEPA law, that's one of the things that the uh, pipeline applicant has to do is analysis of their worst potential spills because if we can engineer for the worst case scenario then we should be able to then we would know what kind of engineering would be necessary to, to protect the public and and, uh, and the environment so basically what I did was was calculate what the worst case spill could be make some estimates on the extent of the of the plumes and and the transport of the materials and then sort of itemize what the uh, populations might be that might be exposed and give some very rough general uh, statements about what some of the impacts might be first of all i went to to trans canada's and their and their consultants documents. And they did um, quote worst case analysis as well. And of course, when a particular entity is doing analysis of their own operation, they tend to uh, err on the side that, that makes them look good. And we all do that, so that's not surprising. Uh, and so then I just looked at, at those assumptions and tried to determine which ones of them made sense and which ones of them didn't make sense, or which ones were good assumptions for, for at least for a public analysis, and which ones were not so good assumptions. The bottom line was they said, so their rate of leaks will be about half the rate of leaks of the older pipelines. And they based that on a, a whole bunch of, of um, situations and components so they said the metal will be better so so that will reduce it they said this the pipe the welds will be better so that will reduce it they said their their monitoring is better so that will reduce and and on and on and on and i think uh i just took exception to the half i don't i don't think it's probably had i don't think the pipelines are twice as good today as they were 40 years ago i just think that's probably unreasonable and so i took those same assumptions and and applied what i think what I thought made more sense. What they didn't do is an actual risk assessment. In a risk assessment, you sh should actually estimate what the risks are to the human populations that might be exposed, to the ecological populations that might be exposed. In their analysis, there is no um, real assessment of what those potential risks are. There's no calculations of potential risk. The, the extent of the risk assessment is, ah, it won't be much, it won't be a big problem. So, uh, we don't really need to worry about it. Give us a permit and, and we'll be fine. Well, uh, everything breaks, right? You build stuff, it corrodes, it gets old, it gets brittle. Things, uh, things just break after time. Um, the specific reasons pipelines break, there's a variety of them. Now, probably off the top of my head, I might not think of all of them, but, but they're under pressure, so that, that applies stress to the, to the metal. Uh, the pressure changes, so the metal has to expand when the pressure goes up, the metal contracts when the pressure goes down, and of course that causes stress through the years. The, these pipelines are heated, the, the oil is heated, or, or it's hot, I shouldn't say it's heated specifically, but it's hot. So that, that applies some, or supplies some stress to the pipeline. There's some corrosion that goes on because there's some suspended particles in this, uh, especially in this kind of material, apparently for the for the XL pipeline, um, there are always welds, and welds aren't perfect, so sometimes the welds break. Uh, there are 
connections where you put in valves and other kinds of um, instrumentation and things. Sometimes those leak, so there's just all kinds of places um, for things to leak. But basically I think it's, it's just pressure and, and old age and eventually metals fatigue and, and they eventually start to leak. Dill bit is just diluted bit bitumen, or bitumen, I guess some of them, some people say. So it's it's just this it's just thick, heavy tar sands, the bitumen, and then they dilute it with, uh, and they won't tell us exactly what they dilute it with. So I always have to kind of hesitate when I say dilute it with, but it's lighter fractions of the oil processing uh, constituents. The way they explain it to me, the in order to make the dill bit run, or in order to make, get the bitumen to run, they have to put these dilutant materials in, mix it in there so that the whole mixture is more runny. There's clearly BTEX in this material they use as the dilutants, um, but it's not entirely BTEX. BTEX, of course, is benzene and toluene and ethylbenzene and xylene. Those just happen to be for the more interesting components of gasoline and fuels and oils, but there's a lot of other compounds that are also runny in these, in fuels and oils, and probably in this diluent. This material is thick and viscous, which means it doesn't flow very easily. So like water has a relatively is not very viscous, so it flows easily. Oil that we think of is, is more viscous than water, so it flows a little more like syrup. And this stuff is especially viscous, so it is, is very thick. And if it's not hot, it it's, gets sort of solid. It's sort of, sort of like tar when it's not hot. And so they, may, they have to keep it under pretty high pressure and pretty high temperatures just to keep it flowable through the pipeline. Well, it depends on where it is. And so if the pipeline is on the surface of core and it, and it happens out in a cornfield or on, on the bare ground, then of course the oil will just spread out on the ground. And this stuff is, is so thick and viscous, it probably won't go very well. It depends how much they spill, of course. But they have a tendency not to go too far. If it spills so that it gets into a river, then, then it'll be a, or some kind of water body, then it'll be a different uh, scenario. As soon as it enters the water column, this dill bit is a mixture of the heavy fractions and the light fractions. So all together it floats. But very quickly after that, the light fractions will dissolve out of the the bulk of the oil dissolve into the water, that will only leave this lump of heavy fractions, which apparently does sink. And all the evidence that I've seen uh, substantiates that. The, uh, the Enbridge spill is, a, is like a poster child. They had this huge amount of stuff on the bottom, and then they had this floating uh, lighter fraction and constituent going downstream. And you ask me how you clean it up, if, if we're talking about that situation, Again, you have the floating stuff, but that's primarily dissolved, so it's very hard to trap. So right down the Kalamazoo River it went, and, and they really didn't get it trapped. It just, it just kept going downstream. They got some of it pumped out of there, but much of it just left. And they're still trying to deal with the stuff on the bottom. So you can go in there and scrape it up, but river bottoms can be pretty heterogeneous, all kinds of vegetation, all kinds of hollows and holes and cracks and crevices and uh, it's just very, very difficult. And I think evidence to date says we just don't know how to do it. If you're in groundwater, the same thing will happen. Groundwater is kind of different though, but, but the groundwater is sitting underneath the ground, but it is moving very slowly. And so if, as this material dissolves into the groundwater, it will then travel down gradient with the groundwater and form a sort of a a slug of contaminated water. There's two things that would get it to spread, maybe three things. One would be just the pressure of the material itself. So as you discharge more and more, the pressure of the newly discharged stuff will push the earlier discharged material farther away. Gravity, of course, will, will pull it downwards. And then there's the lighter fractions again that dissolve into the water and then 
two, several things actually cause them to spread out. Diffusion just tends to make the molecules spread out away from each other, and then the movement of the groundwater itself. If there's even a worst case spill, the, the oil and constituents from the oil from that spill will contaminate Nobody knows how much. This was another complaint that I have with their application. I made a very gross estimate of how big the plume might be, but it was it needs much more study, much more in-depth analysis than I had time to do. But even my worst case analysis, I think I said, I can't remember exactly the numbers, but I think I estimated that absolute worst thing, maybe you'd have a plume something like a half mile wide by half a dozen miles or something like that long. Uh, the Probably the best answer to the cleanup cost question is we don't know how to clean it up and I think we sort of talked about that when we talked about the Kalamazoo River. They've been working on it for two and a half years or something. Now they, they're not even close to cleaning it up. I think most of the well, I shouldn't say they, they've clearly taken a lot of product out of the system, but there's clearly a lot of product left in the system. Some of it has escaped and gone on downstream and, and been forgotten about. Some of it's still there and, and they never will get out of that system. Um, and they've spent hundreds of millions, I don't know exactly what the number is, but they've spent a lot of money trying to clean that place up. The problem is there's really no market to develop technologies for that, so uh, I doubt if we ever get very good at it. better idea would be to stop having these spills.